everyone. Yep. Good. Testing. Good. Okay. Are we ready to go in the sound booth for folks online or like, what, what is happening here? Okay. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Glad to see you all this morning. Uh, this morning, we've got a number from our congregation up at Montreat um, at the annual church retreat. Dr. Brendan Breed is with them, so I'm putting my Dr. Brendan Breed hat on today. He will be back next week and will carry us out through the last three weeks of this series. Um, so I'm glad to be with you all this morning um, for, this, for, this, for this lecture. They're going to they're gonna click my, okay. Let me ask, the, is the live stream good? Are we going? Okay, I'm sorry. All right. So let me start over. Welcome to week two. Uh, this is Finding God in the Wilderness. My name is Cassie Waits. I'm the associate pastor here uh, at First Presbyterian Church Marietta, and my role here is discipleship, which includes Christian education, mission, uh, somehow it also includes stewardship, and, and engagement, and a few other things um, in my bucket. I, I, you know, I'm happy to do what's needed. I love this congregation. I'm so glad to be here with y'all. Uh, this lecture series that we are embarking on, it runs all the way through Palm Sunday, which is March 24th. Um, I, like I said a minute ago, I'm with you this week. Dr. Brennan Breed will be back next week and the weeks following, and we'll be here in the Great Hall uh, at, during the Sunday School Hour for this series. And I hope that, that if you're here today, if you're here online, that you'll continue to join us. Uh, if you miss a week or for whatever reason you need to, you can also go back and watch. The, the live streams will be available on Facebook and on YouTube, and you can watch those as live streams, or you can also watch those as recordings after the fact. Let's open our time today with a word of prayer. God of the wilderness, of hot deserts and cold tundras, of wastelands and borderlands, of forgotten spaces and of forgotten peoples, you call to us from the margins. You beckon us into the wild, for there you are, and there you always have been. When famine comes, may we not fear it. When drought threatens, may we yet endure. When our very survival is at risk, may we rejoice. For we know that you are doing a new thing, bringing forth life abundant, even in those places of death and despair. Thanks be to God. Amen. Last week, Dr. Brennan Breed kicked us off with an overview on wilderness. And he began to ask the question, what is a wilderness? What kind of wildernesses do we find in scripture? What did ancient people believe about wildernesses? And isn't it strange how our God shows up over and over, time and again, in the wilderness? So this week, we dig a little deeper on that, and we start to ask, what is God doing out in the wilderness? And what does that mean for the people who encounter him there? This week, we're going, uh, last week was very broad. This week, we're going to go really narrow, and we're going to look at the story of Hagar from the book of Genesis. When Hagar is cast out into the wilderness, it could be a death sentence for her, but what she finds out there isn't death, it's new life, because God is in the wilderness. So the wilderness, paradoxically, becomes a place of provision, and we're going to take a look at what that means today. Next week on March 10th, we'll study wilderness as a place of formation for God's holy people. On March 17th, we'll study the wilderness of sin and grief. And then on March 24th, on Palm Sunday, we'll wrap up with a look at wildernesses in the Gospels, uh, and particularly the experience of wilderness um, with respect to Jesus. How was, how was Jesus found in the wilderness? So what is a wilderness? And this was the question last week. What is a wilderness? There are lots of different kinds of wildernesses. We learned a wilderness is just an uninhabited or uninhabitable land. So northern Siberia is a kind of wilderness, and so is Yosemite National Park. Last week, Dr. Bree gave some examples of wildernesses specific to the Holy Land, and when he did, he shared some common characteristics of wildernesses that are in our Bible. And some of those characteristics are on the screen um, above you. Uh, wilderness is a place that's barren. It's a place where nothing lives and nothing grows. Last week, we learned that the most drought-resistant crop, barley, needs, does anyone remember how many inches of rain a year barley needs? 12 inches, yeah, that's a, some mouses. 12 inches of rain, but there are wildernesses where only four inches of rain fall. 
So even the most drought resistant crop in the Holy Land can't grow in some of those wilderness areas. The wilderness is also untamed. The wilderness is a place of wildness. It's unregulated. In the ancient world, no nation really cared to claim the wilderness because it was too much trouble. It's too much trouble. Why, why try to control a land that doesn't produce anything? It's not fruitful. It's not valuable. In the, in the ancient world, the wildernesses were, were seen as wastelands, and maybe they are a little bit today too. They were seen as wastelands that no one wanted to take care of or control. We also learned that the wilderness is a place of isolation. So people who do spend time in the wilderness, people who know how to manage spending time in the wilderness, they, they don't always travel in large groups. Because even if you, if you had a group around you, being in the wilderness, uh, it, it's a hard way to live. It's hard to sustain a community out there. So to be in the wilderness means to be cut off from resources, from luxuries, from, the, from just the community of a city. And finally, we, we learn the wilderness is a place where demons show up. You might not have known that. I didn't know that before Dr. Bree taught it to me in seminary. Uh, the wilderness is a place where, 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 where ancient people believe the demons roam. And it's not just demons. Uh, all sorts of unsavory characters end up in the wilderness. Criminals, outcasts, bandits. We might remember the story of King David when he's on the run uh, from King Saul. He goes out into the wilderness and, and he, kind of, he kind of falls in with a group. Uh, I think of them as David's 400 mighty men. They're his little militia. These weren't the, these weren't the cream of the crop people that David was hanging around with because the cream of the crop people don't live in the wilderness. These are folks that, for whatever reason, had to be kind of, they were kind of kicked out of the city. They were not welcome. So there are people out in the wilderness that we may not want to encounter, uh, and, and the ancient people believed there were demons also out in the wilderness that we definitely didn't want to encounter. And so these were all, these were all uh, aspects, all characteristics of wilderness spaces. And yet, God shows up in the wilderness, right? God shows up in the wilderness. Maybe that's why it's so surprising that God shows up in the wilderness. God seems to prefer the wilderness over cities. And it's pretty remarkable. In the ancient world, this goes against what every other culture would expect. You know, in the ancient world, the, the temple to the deity, the, the, the deity that protected the city, that temple was in the city because the idea was that benevolent gods wanted to, like, live near people. <laughs> They were friendly. <laughs> they wanted to live near the people that they were protecting. But our God seems to resist that. And so the cult cultures that do come in contact with Israel are puzzled by their faith. Here is a group of people that insist on worshiping a God that's not found in cities or ever in the midst of people. This is a God that's just found out in the wild. And we know what lives out in the wild. And it's usually not good. So other cultures look a little askew at, at the faith of the Israelites. But God shows up in the wilderness. And in fact, God shows up for plenty of people in the wilderness in our scripture. We have Moses, would be the most famous person that God shows up in the wilderness for. Moses spends about half of his life, wandering the wilderness, 40 years leading the Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt. They don't actually get to the promised land, though, in Moses' lifetime. They just wander the wilderness. And it's one crisis after another crisis after another crisis. And if the crisis isn't that they don't have enough food, it's that they don't have enough water. And if it's not that they don't have enough water, it's that there's infighting. Uh, and so Moses has to deal with all these crises. But out in the wilderness, we read, this re it's remarkable. We read that Moses speaks to God face to face, that Moses encounters God not just once, not just twice, but on the regular. So God shows up for Moses and for the Israelites in the wilderness in a powerful way. We also have Elijah. 
God shows up for Elijah. Not only does Elijah encounter God in the wilderness, the reason he is, is driven to, to leave the city, to leave, leave his whole life behind and run out to Mount Horeb, that's where he goes, Mount Horeb. He has to go through the desert to get there. The reason he leaves and goes into the wilderness is because Elijah is totally burned out. He's given up on his call to be a prophet to the people and he flees into the wilderness and surprise out there, God shows up. God shows up and Elijah encounters God on that mountain. And the same is true for Jesus. We read this, uh, we read this the last couple Sundays. Brendan talked about it last Sunday as well. After Jesus' baptism, he's driven out into the wilderness. And again, it's not just a geographical wilderness with Jesus. He experiences a spiritual wilderness as well. Because for 40 days and nights, he faces all kinds of temptations. And after he faces those temptations, we read that Jesus is ministered to by, not demons, angels. So again, God's presence is found in the wilderness. But it's not just Moses, Elijah, and Jesus that find God in the wilderness. Hagar finds God in the wilderness. Does anyone know who Hagar is? Just raise your hand if you've heard of Hagar. Oh, this is a well-educated group. Look at you guys. Y'all are gonna know, y'all are gonna know all about this. Great, great. So God also shows up for Hagar. Uh, God also shows up for Hagar. Now, who is Hagar? Um, Hagar is an Egyptian slave. She's not an Abraham, she's not a Moses, she's not an Elijah, she's not one of those big names that the average person might know. You guys are not average. The average person might know Moses, Abraham, Elijah, Jesus. She's not a big name. She's not a patriarch of the faith. In, in, in Christianity, I'm not even sure we completely consider her a matriarch of the faith, actually. Hagar's an Egyptian slave, and yet, Hagar has some, some of the most powerful experiences encountering God in the wilderness. God shows up not once, but twice for Hagar in the wilderness. And when God shows up, God saves her life. So who is Hagar? Hagar is a slave to Sarah. Sarah is the wife of Abraham. And how does Sarah end up with an Egyptian slave? Well, Sarah and Abraham, they're living their life. They're going along. Remember, Genesis 12, God says to Abraham, go to the land that I will show you. So Abraham packs everything up, takes Sarah, takes all their, their herds, their cattle, their flocks, and they go. And they, they follow God's lead south. And at some point, there's a famine, and they have to go even further south. And they wind up in Egypt. Remember, they wind up in Egypt where Abraham pretends that Sarah isn't his wife. And then Pharaoh falls in love with Sarah. And then Pharaoh gives Abraham lots and lots of gifts. And then when Pharaoh finds out that Abraham has lied to him, Pharaoh is so appalled, he like kicks them out of the country, but they already have the gifts. So one of those gifts we think was Hagar, that she was an Egyptian slave that Abraham and Sarah picked up while they were in Egypt. Well, meanwhile, as they, they leave Egypt, they go back north, and as, as time progresses, Sarah can't get pregnant. This is, a, this is a big crisis. God has promised Abraham and Sarah uh, that they will, be the, they will have descendants, that more descendants than the stars in the sky, and yet they can't conceive a child. And so Sarah does the, the, the fertility treatment of, of choice in the ancient world. She hands Hagar over to Abraham. So Hagar has gone from, from Egypt. She's been handed to Sarah and Abraham, and now Sarah has handed her over to Abraham. Hagar has no say in this and all that's happened to her. So we have this person of, of very, very little power, very little agency. Hagar does get pregnant, and that pregnancy changes the relationship. So now Sarah gets jealous. It was Sarah's idea. Sarah gets jealous of Hagar and mistreats her, and that brings us to Genesis chapter 16. In Genesis chapter 16, we read the fallout of Sarah's jealousy. Um, and you cannot read that. I'm going to read it for you. Uh, Genesis 16, this is, this is verse 3 through 13a. So after Abraham had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. He went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. 
But Abram said to Sarai, your slave is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and Hagar ran away. The angel of the Lord found Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for a multitude. So Hagar named the Lord who spoke to her. You are El Roy. You are the God who sees. Now Hagar is the only person in the Bible that gives God a name directly like that. You are the God who sees. This person that has no power, that has no status, that has no standing, that has no control over her own life, who had to run away because she was being mistreated and there was no other, she saw another, no other option. So in the wilderness of Shur, we read an angel of the Lord finds Hagar. And you heard that and you're thinking, okay, I heard angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord finds Hagar and blesses her. And did you notice that blessing? Abraham is promised a multitude of offspring. That's in Genesis chapter 15. And now Hagar is promised a multitude of offspring. So many they cannot be counted. So there's this parallel between Abraham, who has all the power, and his encounters with God, and Hagar, who has no power, and her encounters with God. And God still takes care of her. The promises God makes to Abraham are the same promises he makes to Hagar. And during the course of the conversation, we read that angel of the Lord, right? We read that angel of the Lord. Well, well scholars, as they, as they read this story, as they look at this story, they say, yes, but she seems to realize that she's not actually talking to an angel. Because in the end, she suspects she's talking to God. She says, not you are the angel who sees me, you are the God who sees me. And that's when she names God. And it's a big deal. Even Moses didn't name God. Y'all remember Moses in Exodus 3, he asked God, what's your name? What should, who should I tell people sent me? People gonna ask who sent you to, to free, the, free the Israelites, for, or free the Hebrew people from slavery? Who do I tell Pharaoh your name is? And Moses gets the runaround. God says, I am what I am which isn't very helpful. Uh, but Hagar names God, the God who sees me, and God lets her do it. It's pretty amazing. So for Hagar, the wilderness is a place of relationship. Surprisingly, it's a place of relationship. It's even a place of blessing. The wilderness where God meets her, where God sees her, the wilderness is a place where God blesses her. And so in the coming weeks, we're going to learn more about the relationships that are built in the wilderness. God does form relationships with all sorts of people out in the wilderness. And, and we remember the, the, most, the, the most vivid is the Israelites who God bonds with as they wander around saying, you will be my people and I will be your God. And, and even, even enters into covenant with the Israelites as they wander in the wilderness. When we get to the New Testament, we'll see Jesus take off time and again to be alone, to pray. And again, there's a sense that God is more accessible in the wilderness. We have someone on staff here, Rami Palacios, who uh, is, a, is a therapist, and he used to do wilderness therapy. And I said, Rami, I'm talking about wilderness this Sunday. And he said, oh, I love the wilderness. I love the wilderness. He would take, he would take groups of, of, of people who, who needed counseling out into the wilderness and they had, they had programs. Uh, and the idea was something special happens when you, when you go out, when you're away, when you're alone, when you can get really quiet and have to actually listen to your own thoughts, maybe listen to your own conscience. Maybe take a real hard look at your own decisions and your own life. And so wilderness has a way of bringing healing as well. And when we get to the New Testament, we just see that, that people tend to, uh, Jesus tends to gravitate to the wilderness when he needs time to recharge, when he needs time to pray, maybe when he needs time to seek his father. So the wilderness is also a place of relationship, even though it might not seem like that at first. 
This is Hagar's first encounter with God. The second encounter happens a few years later. Hagar returns to Abraham and Sarah. She, she does what she's told. Her child is born and she names him Ishmael. Y'all know that, Ishmael. Then Sarah conceives and she has a child and she names him Isaac, right? She names him Isaac. Uh, now Isaac and Ishmael seem to get along okay. Do Sarah and Hagar get along okay? No. No, the, the relationship never does heal. Hagar is still in the household. Her son is still in the household. And this leads Sarah to take more dramatic measures. Sarah finally gets to a point where she, she doesn't just make life miserable for Hagar. She kicks Hagar out. And Hagar winds up back in the wilderness. This time not uh, by her choice, but by Sarah's choice. And so this brings us to Genesis chapter 21. I'll read for y'all. This is 8 through 14. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a feast on the day uh, that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son, but God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. So last week, we learned that Beersheba was the town on the very edge of the wilderness. It's that last outpost before you hit the desert. I mentioned Elijah earlier, Beersheba is where Elijah leaves his, his helper and he continues out into the wilderness to be alone uh, and ultimately to encounter God. So Beersheba is the last outpost, it's the final, final town on the edge of the frontier. Uh, and this photo is a photo of that wilderness, that's what it looks like. That's where Hagar is wandering. There's, there's nothing out there. I mean, there's rocks, there's sand, there's sky, there's sun, there's nothing out there. She might as well be wandering around on the moon. There's nothing out there. And if you're worried about Hagar and Ishmael, at this point you should be, and if you're angry at Abraham and his failure to do just some, the bare minimum to protect his family, you, you're not alone. And if you're wondering exactly what God had in mind by allowing all this to go down, uh, we're about to find out. So we keep reading. This is still Genesis 21. This is 15 to 19. When the water in the skin was gone, Hagar cast Ishmael under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And she sat opposite of him. She lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, not of Hagar, that's weird. The God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of the Lord called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. So the second time in the wilderness is not the same as the first time. The first time Hagar runs away, the first time Hagar makes it to a well, that's where God finds her the first time, she's at a well. But this time Hagar is thrown out. And this time Hagar doesn't make it to a well. She ends up lost. And she's lost in a wilderness, she's alone with her son, she's run out of water and things do not look very good for Hagar or for Ishmael. By the time God finds Hagar and Ishmael, he's dying and she's given up hope. And it's at that moment when all seems to be lost that God appears, opens her eyes, and suddenly she sees what she probably thought was a mirage at the time. She sees what seems to be impossible. She sees a well of water. Right there, how did she miss it? How did she miss it? 
I want to think about the well for a moment, the water that God shows Hagar that she hadn't seen before. Um, I wonder where the well comes from. We don't know. I wonder how long it's been there. We don't know. Had it been there the whole time and Hagar just missed it? Had it just appeared? Or to, to push it a little further, was the well like the burning bush that Moses encountered in the desert? Had the well been there somehow forever? Was it an eternal source of water? I like, I like to imagine that. I like to imagine it's like the burning bush. It's the water that's just always been there. And God leads Hagar to it. We don't know where the well comes from. We don't know who dug it. We don't know what purpose it was for. But we do know that it's already there. It's already there in that wilderness place, in that place that, that is so barren, where there, nothing is growing. There is no, there's no uh, life. There are no plants. Um, there is, though, a well. And that well is just waiting to be discovered for those with eyes to see. So if you find yourself at this desert that's on, on the screen here, I don't know if, I'm, is anyone a wilderness expert in this room? No, okay, no wilderness experts. If you ended up in this desert and you're like Hagar and you've run out of water, where do you go? To the trees, right? To the palm trees. You guys are wilderness experts. You go to the palm trees. <laughs> that was an easy question. Um, you try to go to the palm trees because there's water there, right? You can't see the water. You can see the trees. Or you go to the valley, because the water runs downhill. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are ways to find signs of life, even in a wilderness. There's still ways to find signs of life. Which, which kind of, on a, a, in a, you know, when it comes to the church, makes me think. Sometimes we feel like we don't have enough help, we don't have enough volunteers, we don't have enough this, we don't have enough that, we, how we could possibly do this ministry. And sometimes what we're called to do isn't to, 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 to work harder, it's to stop and look out and see where there are signs of life. See where there are, there are valleys to, to, to follow, where there, are, uh, where there may be trees to walk toward. And I think that's true not just in the church, it's true in our lives. We hit a dry patch, we hit a rough patch, we hit, we hit a time when we just think, I just, I just am not, I'm not finding life in any of this. Maybe it's an invitation to step back, stop trying so hard, stop working so hard. Don't, don't, Hagar doesn't, it, she's not called to like dig a well right there. God doesn't just give her a shovel and say, well, good luck. <laughs> the water's already provided. Um, and so the wilderness for her becomes a place where the water is already provided which I think is helpful, because if we get lost, if we start to despair, it's helpful to remember that God has gone ahead of us, that God is already providing for us. In fact, God might be most powerfully there for us in the wildernesses of life. And what I love about her story is that in that wilderness place, God seeks her out. And in our wilderness places, perhaps we can trust that God is already they're seeking us out. And the question is, do we recognize him? Do we see the God who sees us? For Hagar, the wilderness is a place of provision. And that's a surprise. You don't think of the wilderness as a place of provision. There's nothing there. And what is there, if, if there are animals there, they're usually very dangerous. <laughs> it's not a place we think of as a place of provision. But this is where God is. It's where God meets Hagar's needs. Now, the first time God turns her back and says, go home, the second time God gives her fuel for her journey. Hagar lives the rest of her life in wilderness lands. Her son grows up in the wilderness. He takes a wife. He has a family. That family grows and grows. And God's blessing comes to fruition. Centuries pass, and other people will encounter God in this very same wilderness. The same wilderness Hagar is in right now with her son Ishmael, Moses will pass through. And the Israelites will pass through. And they will also meet God in these places, these desolate places where Hagar met God. And they will find that out here in the wilderness, this place of no provision, God yet provides. So this theme of, of provision in places of lack and desolation winds throughout our whole Bible. 
Not only does God provide water in the wilderness, God calls forth life from places of death. And, and you might have heard that from a pulpit or you might have heard that in a Sunday school class, but it's true, this theme comes up over and over and over again starting from the earliest pages of Genesis all the way through Revelation. Barrenness is turned to fruitfulness. Uh, we see this in the miracle birth stories. We have Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, all three of these matriarchs of the faith had problems conceiving, and yet they were made able to conceive. So we have barrenness to fruitfulness. Hannah conceives Samuel, even though she, she's barren. Elizabeth conceives John the Baptist, even though she was too old to have children. We also see this movement from despair to hope. So Elijah runs out into the wilderness despairing, has given up on his, his call as a prophet, has just given up on everything. And out in the wilderness where there is nothing, he finds God and God provides what he needs to continue his journey. Hagar runs out into the wilderness in despair and again she encounters God and God gives her the fuel she needs for her journey. So we see a movement from despair to hope. And then the ultimate, the ultimate reversal, the ultimate example of this is we see a movement from death to resurrection or death to new life. So Jesus is the answer to this one. Jesus is the one we see that moves from death to new life. But we also have examples that aren't, they're, they're echoes of the story of Jesus in Lazarus, Jesus' friend who he raises, we read that Lazarus dies and he's dead dead. He's dead dead. Jesus shows up and everyone's in tears and they're mad at him because he wasn't there to, to save the day. And Jesus has them open the tomb and he calls forth Lazarus. And so Lazarus is this resurrection story, happens a week before Jesus' own death. And it's again a sign of that movement from death to new life. In Ezekiel, we have a passage in Ezekiel 37 called the, pass the Valley of the Dry Bones. And if you've heard this passage, it's, it's a it's a strange, it's a good Halloween passage. Um, there are all these bones on the ground and all of a sudden as, as Ezekiel looks out, they start to form together into people and then suddenly a multitude of people are standing before Ezekiel and God uh, gives him this vision as, as a way of saying, Ezekiel, so, such will I do for my people. This is what I will do for my people. I will revive them. I will bring them back because at this point, um, the, the people of Judah had been, had They'd been overtaken by the Babylonians. The walls of Jerusalem had been torn down. Their, their nation had been destroyed. Their temple had been overrun. Um, and God says, no, I know these people feel like they have no spirit left in them, but I will, I will raise them up again. And so there is this movement from death to resurrection, death to new life, also in our Bible. Um, but it, it, it's not just death to resurrection in the Gospels, in the story of Jesus. It happens all throughout. So as Christians, we see this repeat, repeated theme. And we can say that it's a mark of God's handiwork, this provision in the wilderness. We could go as far as to say that God is most present to us, most available to us in the wildernesses of life. And... In fact, if we look close enough, we realize that God doesn't just start showing up in the wilderness for Hagar. God doesn't just start showing up in, in Genesis 16 in the wilderness. God shows up in the wilderness from the very beginning. So if we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, Remember Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void, darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And from that watery chaos, God begins to create. That's Genesis chapter 1. God's creating from this watery world. But then Genesis chapter 2 starts in a different place, right? And if you've read it, you remember, instead of water, Genesis chapter 2 starts with a wilderness, and so let's read just a little bit from Genesis chapter 2 and you'll see it. This is Genesis 2, 5 through 8. When no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no vegetation of the field had sprung up, for the Lord God had caused it, not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man who he had formed. So in Genesis chapter 2, the wilderness is the place that God creates. It's where God creates. God not only creates relationships in the wilderness, God not only provides new opportunities in the wilderness, 
God takes this place of waste and death and says, I can do something with that. I can do something with that, which means if we are in a place <laughs> that feels like a wasteland, God looks at those places in our lives and says, I can do something with that. I can do something with you. And this is what I think it means to live as people of faith. This is the, what we call the Easter hope. The greater the wilderness, the greater should be our confidence. The bleaker the situation feels, the brighter our hope should be because our God glories in the wilderness. Our God specializes in the wilderness. And we can be assured that in the very place where we fear we're all alone, we are never, ever alone because that's the very place that we find God. We got about five minutes before the choir comes in and starts practicing. Um, and before, I, I'm gonna close in prayer, but I'll let y'all know if y'all have thoughts, if you have any, any thoughts? I'll let y'all talk. Y'all are, okay, okay, good, we're good. All right, I just, I, I'm used to the interaction more. This is a more of a lecture. Um, well, let's go ahead, we'll close in prayer. Um, but I just, I, I, I'm glad to be with y'all this morning and to uh, think about this topic because I do think that Central to our faith is this idea that God works in those very wildernesses that can lead us to despair. Um, and so when we are facing those times in our lives, when we're facing what it feels like a terrible rough patch, or we, we're facing a, a time when we feel just completely lost and out of water, um, that is the time that, that we, we can have, still have hope and that we are given hope because of these stories, because of these examples that God tells us over and over and over again, do not fear those wildernesses. Do not be afraid of them. Do not despair in them. Do not get hopeless in them because that's where, that's most powerfully where, where we encounter God. So let's close in prayer. Holy God, the one who sees us in the wildernesses of our lives, keep us from despair. For in those barren places where all hope seems lost, it is then and there that we find you. Open our eyes to see you as clearly as you see us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all. All right.